Alrighty then, let's get started, shall we? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Let's turn the game audio on, shall we? Alright. Uh, I'm a little quiet. Let's go turn that up a bit. Uh, there we go. That should be adequate. Alright. Last time around, we finished up Trial 1.4, where we successfully defended Sosuke and Atsume from uh, being accused of the heinous crime of uh, attempted murder. Uh, as it turns out, it was another tragic accident. We sure are running into a lot of those lately. Um, not that I'm saying I want a murder or anything of the sort. I'm just saying, you know, we've got some interesting cases in this game. Like accidents between you know really terrible people doing murders and just awful accidents happening it's kind of been all over the place which is actually really interesting to see uh in any case uh we found our footing as a lawyer we we know what we want to do we want to pursue the truth you know not be a good defense lawyer and try to get our client off no matter what but we want to discover the truth that's what it means to be a lawyer in, in this, these games, anyway. Episode 5. The Adventure of the Unspeakable Story. The Howl of the Baskervilles. It's coming! Jones's cry pierced through the thick wall of fog around us. Wisps of vapor flowed over the pistol as I cocked it, and I waited breathlessly in the stillness. The silence lasted for what seemed an eternity, until, at last, it appeared. From the shadows of the cloud, an enormous beast sprang out upon us. A hound it was, but not such a hound as any mortal has ever seen. Its eyes glowed with a smoldering glare. The whole of its ox-sized body was outlined in white-hot flames. Its rumbling pant and hideous howl, so terrified was I that I began to tremble with fear. Look well, Wilson, Holmes declared, gazing upon the mystical beast. For this, this is the diabolical hound of the Baskervilles. I always like these little intro cutscenes. Our first two months in London passed by in a flash. In that disconcerting courtroom experience we were first thrown into on the day we arrived in the country. And in Soseki-san's terrible ordeal that had followed closely behind, we had emerged victorious. However... Oh no, sorry, you got work in half an hour, I'm sorry. There then came an abrupt end to our opportunities to appear in court. Which was hardly surprising, of course since I was nothing more than an amateur, an unknown student of law from a faraway land. So life in our little office was very quiet. That is, until it was shattered one day by that fateful telegram. Naruhoto's Legal Consultancy. All right, I've got one of those now. That morning, I was woken by the unreserved knocking on the door by the telegram boy. But after he'd gone, Suzato-san's behavior became very obviously strange. Um, Suzato-san? Yes? Is it time to leave for court already? Let me see. What case is it today? I... Don't think I'm scheduled to defend anyone at the moment, am I? Oh, uh, no, of course not. How silly of me. But I think Iris said she would make us breakfast this morning. So, shall we go down to Mr. Sholmes' suite? Yes. Iris makes the most delicious breakfast food. She does, doesn't she? And once our bellies are full, we can leave for court in fit fighting form. Let me see. What case is it today? Here we go again. So, 
what was it about? The telegram that was delivered this morning, I mean. Oh, uh, a telegram? I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, but you're not going to get away with that. Well, I didn't think I would. Actually, um... Don't give it a moment's thought. It's nothing. Nothing interesting. Boring, in fact. Um, it was just a boring old telegram. That's three times now she's tried and failed to convince me it was nothing. I promise that I'll tell you about it at some point. Alright, I understand. I suppose Soseki-san will have arrived back in Japan by now, won't he? Yes, I should think so. He left immediately after that terrible ordeal. Which would mean he should have completed the voyage already, or be just a few days away. A fortnight ago, we had that very long telegram from him, do you remember? Complaining of seasickness. But by and large, it seems the voyage has been going well. Is something wrong, Naruhoto-san? I was just wondering, what might have become of Soseki-san had he stayed in London? That's all. You mean, as regards to Lord Van Zeeks, the Reaper? Yes, I can't help wondering if seasickness would have paled into insignificance in that case. What is it they say? That no one who stands in the dock can be saved from the Reaper, right? Like the way that nightmarish trial ended on the very day we arrived in London. Even two months ago, the cause of that dreadful fire is still a mystery. Yes, but at least Soseki-san is safely out of the country now. Presumably that means... That the Curse of the Reaper can only take effect within the confines of the city of London, perhaps? Even if that's the case, it's little comfort. I have a terrible sense of foreboding. If the legend of the Reaper is to be believed, it would mean that he wields the Sword of Justice himself. <laughs> uh... Yeah, this is a brand new case. We're just starting Crimson. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> Yeah, we've really got the, uh, the Cursed Attic on 221B Baker Street. <laughs> it's, it's not the Cursed Room, it's, it's his, it's Shomes' attic. <laughs> Come to think of it, I wonder what he's been up to these past two months. Surely not wielding that sword against more acquitted defendants. No, I don't think so. Apparently, Lord Van Zeeks hasn't appeared in court once since our last encounter. Oh? Yes, since Soseki-san's trial, he's withdrawn from judicial service again, it seems. But really? Just like before, when he wasn't seen in court at all for several years. So it's just been me who's had to face him in his recent spate of trials, then. Ugh, just my luck. I wonder if luck doesn't come into it. Uh, sorry? What was that? Oh. Nothing? Uh, never mind. No, no. Cl cl clarify your statement, Suzato. Here, check out my armband. Bless you, Shomes, though I bet he just wants us around to help him out. <laughs> hey, he needs a partner for his great deductions, and that's what we're here for. <laughs> it means a great deal to me, you know. That you cherish his armband so, and wear it each time you appear in court. Well, it's very important to me. It's what shows that I'm a lawyer. And, whenever I wear it, I feel as though it gives me strength, through Cosmo. I absolutely can't be without it, especially when I'm at a critical point in a trial. But, just the other day, I noticed you wearing it when we went to visit that park. Sometimes I forget to take it off. <laughs> uh, certain members of the Falcom fandom have astounded me again, and for all the wrong reasons. I think I know what this is about. Uh, this is probably about the uh, cease and desist that Nisa gave to that group that was translating Hajimari, you know, 
like four months after they decided, hey, we're actually releasing these games in English. So, you know, there's official licensing. We have rights. You can't, you can't step on an official licensing people or something. No, that's, you, can, you just can't do that. Uh... It would be like me saying, okay, well, I know that, uh, I don't know, say Tales of Arise. I've got the Japanese version of it, somehow, even though it's releasing worldwide. I'm gonna go translate into English two months before, uh, Bamco releases it. Yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm just scrolling through this because this is all optional stuff. <laughs> Although, this looks important. Ah, this must be the telegram. Let's see. Ah, no, you mustn't look at that. Not under any circumstances. Uh, all right, I, I won't. I'm sorry, naruhoto san but you can be very mischievous at times. Then put the telegram away if you don't want people looking at it. No, but I, I, I want to look at it. Game, let, let me look at it. I guess that was just a random piece of paper rather than anything important. It's a wonderful invention, isn't it? The sea, behind glass, inside your room. Another example of Great Britain's greatness. Having to clean it out and change the water isn't so great though, is it? <laughs> Do you know, I've never seen inside your room there, Suzato-san. I've never even peeped inside. I, I should think so too. A young maiden's private chamber is a place of bittersweet secrets, you know. Whatever you say, young maiden. Yeah, Geofront deleted all their links as soon as Nisa announced it, and they were prepared for that inevitability. They were like, okay, there's a chance that they could release these games in English. They could announce it, and we would have to stop what we were doing. So, they had they had everything ready to go in that instance. They had, uh, you know, site set up, graphics set up, everything they needed to get set up. All the links able to take down at a moment's notice. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing you have to do when you deal with that stuff. Alright then, let's go, let's go get some breakfast. <laughs> 15th of April, Shomes is sweet. <laughs> Not like we still don't have Kitsune, seriously. Yeah. If you guys want, if you want the translation fast, there's an overlay program. You can do it now. <laughs> Crow Bonsai. <laughs> morning, Runo. Morning, Susie. Good morning, Iris. Um, Iris. What is it, Runo? What is that terrible noise? It sounds like a cat being strangled. Oh, yes. You noticed that, did you? Shomes, what are you doing? Hurley isn't in the best form this morning, it seems. Elliot Craig, he is not. Hello. Hello, Mr. Shomes. G good morning? A good morning to die, perhaps. H has something happened, Mr. Shomes? You look miserable, and the way you were playing the violin before? <laughs> My analytical mind is dead. Music is dead. The world is dead. Damn this blanched existence! That's all it is, my dear fellow. Nothing of consequence. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, Iris, 
Isn't it time we ate? <laughs> Some dry toast and insipid coffee for me, if it's not too much trouble. It's a cat. Oh, it's so precious. Oh, look, it's Wagahai. <laughs> yeah, uh, no need to pressure Kitsune either. Whether he decides to do it or not, it's up to him. So, you know, don't get spoiled by thinking it's going to happen. Good morning, boy. That must be some sort of tiny door for cats to use. But how did it get there? Well then, everyone. Time for breakfast. Oh, wonderful. Let me help you, Iris. Uh, it would indeed be a fine day to die. Uh, I knew something looked different. Something's missing from Mr. Sholmes' desk. Damn cat, can't escape them in any Japanese games. <laughs> Look at Mr. Sholmes' desk, it's completely clear. Isn't that enormous machine you see on it? We can never hope to understand what goes on in the great detective's mind, Mr. Naruhodo. Why, next time we're invited, we may find he's vacated the entire suite. So that's scarily plausible, actually. Enjoying the British voice acting and dialogue? Oh, certainly. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And it uh, lets me, you know, utilize my wide variety of British accents, which are Cockney, uh, Cocky, whatever the hell the accent on Coronation Street is, and, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Voice acting's a bit of a stress when it's just the little cutscenes, and HOLD IT! OBJECTION! <laughs> all sorts of things on these shelves. Chemistry apparatus, books, papers, and lots of things I've never seen before. It's all heaped up so high I can't help feeling that the whole lot is going to topple at any moment. Oh, it's such a charmingly untidy collection of paraphernalia, isn't it? It just looks messy to me. <laughs> but you, Mr. Naruhodo, must learn to tidy up after yourself. No favoritism there, then. Uh, if I had, it's been many moons since I've seen it. <laughs> Looks like that huge metal chest is being used as a table for tea and coffee. It seems very sturdy with an equally sturdy lock. Mr. Naruhodo, you mustn't go around opening things. I always have to keep an eye on you, don't I? You're very mischievous. How did you come to that conclusion? Alright, let's talk to Iris. Mr. Natsume's cat seems to have settled into his new home, then. Oh, yes. And I've become very attached to little Waggy. It appears his previous owner's completely forgotten to him. Cats are unfeeling creatures. Their muse is empty as the hearts of the muses. If Mr. Natsume had no intention of taking Waggy back to Japan, I wonder why he kept him in the first place. I expect he would have taken him if he could, but pets are strictly forbidden aboard steamships in our experience. And for good reason, terrible things can happen on the rules of passage are not obeyed. Well, I don't mind, because Waggy's adorable! Aw, oh, that's so precious. Yes, he really is. Oh, yes, what about the door? I don't remember seeing that tiny thing in the main door before. Where did that come from? Oh, you noticed? You are observant, Runo. Look! I used this. It's my latest invention. What? What is that? I call it the Cat flap -a mat Gosh! A machine for making doors? Just for cats? That's right! It can make a cat flap for a little furry friend like Waggy in seconds. And it can do it at any door at all, no matter what it's made of. 
It's very powerful, you see. Hold it! You can't just start the next case without me around. <laughs> Sorry, Lenny. <laughs> I did. I did give. I did give notice that I was streaming. Also, Iris is adorable. Yes, absolutely. Wouldn't it have been quicker just to make the cat flap rather than making a machine to make the cat flap? Well, yes, maybe, but now I can make cat flaps anywhere I like. Oh, I think it's wonderful. You must make one for us in the door of our office upstairs, Iris. She really knows how to come with unconventional inventions, this girl. <laughs> Aw, adorable. These are all mementos of Mr. Sholmes' past cases, I think. If he'd been involved in my case, I wonder if the beefsteak from Le Carnival would be on display here. A mystery shoe, a curious hammer, some mysterious dancing men, a bust of Napoleon. Oh, what an entrancing collection. It looks like an untidy assortment of junk to me, rather than like what's on my own shelves. Well, you really ought to learn to keep your things in order, Mr. Naruhodo. No, no favoritism there at all. <laughs> Nisa having Ryanosuke on standby for those CODs. <laughs> Technically, Ryanosuke is a barrister. They're sending solicitors after these guys. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's talk to this dead man. You seem to be very unhappy this morning, Mr. Shones. What's happened? used to be the case, that in my hands, this violin sung like the dawn chorus, its melissonate tones would make flowers bloom. It, it would? But now, the muses are unamused with me. The goddesses of music have thrown me over. They send in Zeke's instead, and he just throws in a wine bottle as the actual C&T. It almost sounds like he's giving it as a gift when you say he throws it in. <laughs> no, he just throws one at them. Pray, forgive the discourtesy. Oh god, the glass shards are in my eyes! Whatever do you mean, Mr. Sholmes? For hours I have bowed, for days even. Through the night I have endeavored to no avail. That sound, my tone is lost. That brilliant, clear, unwavering tone. Gone forever! No more recitals of unbridled emotion! Well, you haven't been practicing much lately, have you, Hurley? Don't worry, I'm sure he'll come back to you in time. Heed my words, Mr. Naruhodo. The goddesses of the arts are fickle. One day, they bestow genius on a man. The next, they unmercifully withdraw it. Oh, dear. Ah, uh, why is this happening to me? They take the turn I have for the violin for me. What is left for pity's sake? What is left? Um, deduction, perhaps? Isn't that what you're known for? Mr. Sholmes, I don't like to pry, but... Your desk looks rather empty today. Ah, well done, Miss Suzato. Your observational skills do you credit. Oh, no, Mr. Sholmes. They pale into insignificance when compared to yours. You'd struggle not to notice, wouldn't you? You mean Hurley's great analytoscope? That's at Windabanks now. Sorry? It's at a windy bank? No! Windabanks! The pawn brokery! Pawn? Wh what? You mean you pawned that enormous machine of yours? It has some considerable value, you see. Quite undeservingly. But isn't it a very important machine for your work? I do wish you had consulted us if, if your situation had become so desperate. I would have gladly passed what little income I have to you. Suzaru, no. Bad. Dear madame, things are far from desperate. But, but the pawnbroker has your wonderful machine. 
How can it be anything but desperate? Making use of a pawnbroker is quite ordinary here in London, I assure you. It, it is? It doesn't sound ordinary at all. It would seem that neither of you fully understand how pawnbroking works. Oh? What's to understand exactly? And how is this rel going to be relevant to our case? Because <laughs> this is entirely what it feels like. <laughs> What did you mean when you said we didn't fully understand how pawnbroking works? To the people of London, pawnbrokeries are akin to banks. Banks? On Mondays, merchants relinquish their finest jackets and trappings to their pawnbroker of choice. With the money they receive in return, they are able to trade happily through the week. And then on Saturdays, they go to recover their things using the money they've earned. I, I had no idea. This has been a fascinating lesson for us. Everyone does it, you see. Especially people in inner London. And should they have money to spare, they would purchase another fine jacket. Not to wear, obviously. But to pawn, should the need arise. Oh, how ingenious! So, whenever we have something that's getting in the way, we leave it at Windebank, sissy. Pawn brokery can be thought of as an extremely secure vault. Who would have thought that even pawn brokers are different here in Great Britain? Of course, you have to watch Hurley with it. Sometimes he pawns things he really shouldn't. Don't you, Hurley? What does it matter? The world is dead to me now. Oh, poor Sholmes. Oh, what was that? Wagahai? Uh-oh. That's not good. What was that? Oh no! Wagahai's tangled up in your violin! I think he thinks it's a toy. No! What's he doing to it? Oh dear. Mr. Sholmes' precious violin. Why should I care? What? I shouldn't be surprised. If the cat is a more accomplished musician than I... Mr. Sholmes really is in poor spirits, isn't he? Well, anyway, I'll put it back where it lives, shall I, Hurley? Out of the cat's reach, if possible. Maybe we should assess the damage. Oh. Look where, where it at. So this is the violin, is it? It's, uh, Stradivarius, one of the finest violins in the world, made by the renowned Italian luthier, Antonio Stradivari. Oh, I, I see. Doesn't really look like anything special to me. I happened upon it covered in dust, languishing in a pawn shop down a nondescript back alley. The broker had no idea of its value, so I was able to purchase it. God, I know you're in low spirit, Sholmes, but please talk faster. So I was able to purchase it for a mere 55 shillings. How honorable of you. And until today, it had been my faithful companion in every great Paganini-inspired performance I have made. I ask you, is there a reason to live in a world devoid of music? To tolerate this blanched existence? No! There is none! Jumps looks like me when I find out it's gonna rain when I'm about to start skiing for a day. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. <laughs> um, Mr. Sholmes. What, dear madame, what? My thoughts are preoccupied with fancies of release from this dull routine. Well, it's about the violin. It looks very different to normal, don't you think? Hmm. 
Hmm? What do you mean, Miss Suzato? Oh, Susie's right! Yes, the tone of this wood is completely different. And that's not all. I'm sure there was no crack here before. Wait, it's not even the right size, is it? What's this? I'm terribly sorry to have to tell you this, Mr. Sholmes, but... That instrument isn't a violin at all. Then... what? I believe... It's an entirely different instrument, called a viola! What? 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 <laughs> oh, Mr. Sholmes, are you alright? You're right! You are quite right! This isn't my faithful Stradivarius! So what, pray, is this piece of stringed flotsam? Not your faithful performing partner, then? <laughs> I love how intense the music was for something so mundane. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I see what must have happened. You do, Iris? This is just a simple mix-up. Sounds like Iris might be able to tell us exactly what happened if we asked her. Didn't even know what he was playing. Yeah, I understand that violins and violas look similar and have similar names, but I guess they play completely differently. What do you mean by a mix-up, Iris? Well, you see, this violin, uh, sorry, this viola, I mean, was at Windebanks until last week. Uh, at the pawnbrokers? Not Mr. Sholm's beloved musical partner. And there's a proverb from the East, with which you are no doubt familiar, my dear fellows. Always let a beloved child travel. Yes, indeed. So you sent your beloved violin to the pawnbrokers in the hope that it would experience personal growth? Oh, what a wonderful idea! Last week, I pawned my great analytoscope in order to release my precious instrument. But it would appear Mr. Windbag mistakenly furnished me with this tawdry fiddle instead. But my ears cannot be deceived by the hollow timber of this piece of timber. Sorry, hollow timbre of this piece of timber. <laughs> no, but your every sense was deceived by the fact that it just had strings. Pshaw, a fine state of affairs this is. And why I always say, Mr. Naruhodo, never trust a pawnbroker. They'll try to fiddle you every time. <laughs> Puns. But earlier you told us you could think of a pawnbrokery as an extremely secure vault. Come, Mr. Naruhodo, dilly dallying will get you nowhere. N sorry? Crunching your toast with that vacant aspect? Fressing your coffee so obtusely? Are you not a little embarrassed by your own conduct, considering the urgency with which we are fated? We must visit Mr. Windebank's brokery at once. That's right, isn't it, Mr. Sholmes? Precisely, Miss Suzato. Without a moment's delay. But, but I haven't finished my bacon and eggs. My dear fellow, surely you do not still intend to crunch your bacon with an increasingly vacant aspect Press your egg ever more obtusely. All right, all right, say no more. Well, let's go then. Don't worry, Bruno. I'd be happy to heat it up for you again later. Oh, thank you, Iris. As it happens, I am rather curious to see what a British pawnbroker's looks like. Hold on, I got something very important to show him. I must stop you there, Mr. Naruhodo. Unofficial I may be, but I am nevertheless a professional. I couldn't examine such a humdrum item. For anything less than five pounds. Oh, no. I didn't really want you to examine it. I just wanted to ask if... My dear fellow! As a professional consulting detective, I couldn't possibly venture an opinion. For anything less than five pounds. Are you perhaps hoping to purchase a new telescope in the near future, Mr. Sholmes? 
Indeed I am. As you know, it has long been an ambition of mine to discover a new star and name it for myself. Because your earthly stardom isn't enough. I'm just heading there directly. Deal with it. 15th of April, Windebanks Pawn Brokery. So, this is a British pawn brokery? Oh my, there are all sorts of tools and contraptions in here that I've never laid eyes on before. Ah, Suzato-san, and that spark of wonder in your eyes. You can't wait to scour the shelves, can you? I get the impression you enjoy places like this? Oh yes, I don't know why, but seeing such a lot of things I don't understand is a real thrill for me. My dear fellows, let us not forget why we are here. Oh, Mr. Sholmes. We are calling on matters of business, not pleasure. Sorry, that went too slowly and I thought he was going to say busyness and not business. <laughs> and clearly Mr. Sholmes means business too. Judging from the spark of fury in his eyes. Ah, Mr. Sholmes, sir. Welcome back. Did you hear that brazen welcome? Well, yes, we are potential customers, after all. We are disgruntled customers, Mr. Naruhodo. It is time to inform Mr. Winderbank of our ire. Come! The fight is afoot. Naturally, you will recall this, which I retrieved from you some days ago. Yes. This second-rate fiddle is not my faithful instrument, Mr. Windebank. The color of the wood is different. It has holes in it. It's not even the same size. A wonderful summary of our observations, Mr. Sholmes. I'm, I'm so very sorry, sir. How utterly unforgivable of me! An inexcusable mistake for a pawnbroker! There's only one way to make amends. What the fuck? Excuse you! <laughs> I shall have to take my own life! What? <laughs> I... I don't think that will be necessary, do you? If I may just say one thing before I pop off. Ah, uh, yes. It was you, sir, Mr. Sholmes, who took it upon himself to remove the item the other day, I believe. And here we have cheery music when a man's threatening to shoot himself. Uh, sorry? As I recall, I entered the storeroom to fetch your violin when I heard... Ah, here it is. You did? And when I turned to controvert you, you, you had taken the viola and left, sir. However, there can be no doubt that the blame lies firmly at my own door for allowing you to leave. So I shall not grumble or grouse any longer. May this guilt die with me. No, 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 stop, my dear fellow. That The fault is mine. That's one way to deal with a Karen. I should try that next time. Although, no. Probably what would happen is like, yeah, go ahead, shoot yourself. What do I care? <laughs> Whew. It would appear that the fight is over. I do humbly apologize, Mr. Windbank. Evidently, my questionable disposition precipitated this tragedy. Precipitated it. God damn it. Well, you wouldn't be Mr. Herlock Sholmes without that questionable disposition now, would you? Aha! I do believe you may be right, sir. Ah, 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 ah. It's either laugh or cry, I suppose. You are, it must be said, one of my more challenging customers. I needn't remind you of the peculiar collection of items you brought me through my door in the past. Oh? Peculiar items? In the extreme, ma'am. For example... The unpublished manuscript of an eponymous work, 
The novels of Herlock Sholmes or some such. Oh my, a new full-fledged novel? And unpublished? A story I've yet to read, you mean? Ah, forgive me. Wait, before you die, you must tell me more. Oh god. I must know more. Tell me everything. Wow, Cesaro-san's really fired up now. Is there really an, an unpublished story under this very roof? Well, one day the gentleman here brought in an old metal chest, you see. I should like to entrust this to your care for a while, Mr. Windebank. Hmm. For a chest like that. One shilling, sir. Not a farthing more. It houses something of very great value indeed. The latest manuscript recounting the adventures of one Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Uh, I beg your pardon. A, a, a manuscript? You wish to deposit a manuscript? Indeed I do. For I am confident it will be quite safe here. And that was that. As such, Mr. Sholmes' latest tale of otherworldly mystery lies dormant in my storeroom. Mr. Sholmes, is that really true? Do I sense that someone doesn't want to talk about this? I continue to pay your fee, do I not? Then kindly continue to store my belongings. Securely. Of course, sir. Of course. They're safe and sound with me, I assure you. On my life! This is all very strange. I wonder, could I ask you something? Ah, a gentleman from the east, I see. Yes, that sable suit. I suppose I could offer you sixpence for it. Without wishing to offend, the tone is somewhat dull. Sorry. Ah, but for your splendid attire, ma'am. Five guineas, no less. The colors are exquisite. The design, exotic. Eastern artistry at its finest, must I say. Oh my. Five guineas, you say? How interesting. Why do I feel as though I've suffered some sort of defeat here? <laughs> Actually, I was hoping to ask about your business. I've heard it said that palm brokeries are used rather like banks here in London. Yes, sir, indeed. Many of my customers utilize the establishment as you describe. I praise their items and offer them a proportionate loan and two months of secure stowage. If, in that time, they repay the original sum to me, plus the agreed interest, their items are happily returned. But what happens if they don't pay you the money? Then the items are offered for sale in my shop, as you can see on the shelves behind me. So you never sell items before the two months has passed, then? That's right, ma'am, that's right. Which means some considerable responsibility rests on my shoulders. Should a customer's precious belongings be lost, the only recompense is for me to end it all! The very idea, Mr. Windebank, is an absurdity. One should never talk of one's demise so casually. Says the man who was telling us it was a good day to die only this morning. God. <laughs> and let us not forget that I have already helped you take measures to ensure such a tragedy never occurs. Oh? What sort of measures? I engineered a simple device which Mr. Windebank has installed here in the shop. I call it the Red-Handed Recorder. Is that not so, Mr. Windebank? <sighs> what was that deep sigh about? What on earth is a red-handed recorder? Use your eyes, my dear fellow! There are two just below the ceiling. I can see what appears to be a camera attached to some sort of timing device. Very astute! It is indeed a camera, furnished with some hundred pieces of celluloid film. And every 30 minutes precisely, the camera automatically records the appearance of the shop. Here, I have an example I can show you. 
Ah yes, a print from the camera set to record the activity at the shop counter. I developed a special type of film so sensitive it produces a crystal clear image even in darkness. Really? That's extraordinary. Yes, you can clearly see the counter and the door behind it. Look! So you see, were someone to enter the premises with ill intent, his identity would be summarily ex exposed. But did you not say that the photographic prints were taken at 30 minute intervals? Indeed, as you say, my dear madame. Then what if the incident were to occur in between times? One could only say, that would be a cruel twist of fate. Hmm. Must confess, your devices have been giving me some cause for distress as of late. I beg your pardon, Mr. Windbank. Surely they are anything but distressing. Reassuring is the word. It's the cost of the film, sir. You most graciously placed not one, but two cameras in my shop, after all means I must pay for nigh on 100 utterly useless prints every single day. I'm afraid the cost of the film will break me before I'm very much older. Nevertheless, a small price to pay to ensure the safety of my preferred pawnbroker, you know? My dear fellows, we verge on an age where safety and security come at a price. Oh, heaven help us. <laughs> now then, Mr. Sholmes, allow me to return your precious violin. <sighs> the very thing. Thank you, Mr. Windebank. Perhaps this might mark the end of the peculiar items you tried to pop, hmm? Because if anything were to happen to one of them, this would be the only answer. Um, I really think you ought to stop waving that gun around. Someone could get hurt. Fear not! Sorry. I've only loaded a single bullet, so no one but myself could possibly be harmed. That's not really what I meant. <laughs> oh my god. What is with these people? Good day to you then, Mr. Windbank. It's been a pleasure as always, Mr. Shobes. So, Mr. Naruhodo, now we can explore at last. Now we can save. Because I haven't saved since I started. <laughs> Alright. Let's go... Let's go have a look-see, shall we? Look at that enormous ledger open on the counter there. Mr. Windebank is, if nothing else, very particular about recording the items he accepts. He'd have to be. Otherwise, he'd get himself into all sorts of trouble. Which might explain the thing that catches my eye far more than the ledger. This revolver here. Do not entertain even a single thought of pilfering an article herein, my dear fellow. Hmm? I assure you, Mr. Windbank would not hesitate to draw that weapon with the speed belying his portly size. Oh. Y you don't mean he'd... Blow his brains out! Indeed, in recompense for his blunder. Oh my. But in any case, of course we'd never do such a thing. How could you even suggest it? There seems to be a little door hidden behind that curtain there. That leads to the storage room, where Mr. Windbank keeps articles that are currently in pawn. Oh, I see. There's nothing of particular interest inside. I certainly wouldn't recommend any loss in this activity. Uh, recommend or not, it's not something I tend to do. There is but one key, and Mr. Windbank keeps it in his pocket at all times. Before he sleeps, he places it into a small pot, which he slides under his pillow. Uh, how on earth did you know about that, Mr. Sholmes? I am a detective, sir. It is my business to know what others do not. I am frequently assailed by information that I neither care for, nor wish to retain. <laughs> I feel like that's just, uh... <laughs> that's just like social media dot text. 
I am frequently assailed by information that I neither care for nor wish to retain. Uh, I love it. Mr. Sholmes, you are a wonder. And the prime suspect of this pawnbroker is ever burgled. Look at this! What could this lovely, big, shiny box be? That, my dear madame, is a music box. Surely you have such things in your own country. Oh my, yes, but I've certainly never seen one so large before. <laughs> that line is great. I'm gonna have to screenshot that one for future use. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Shall we listen a while? Oh, what a sublime sound. It's like the music of angels. I've never heard anything like it before in my life. This particular specimen is of the larger variety, commonly found in public houses and restaurants. There is a metal disc inside on which the notes to be played are recorded. Simply by replacing the disc with another, any music you care to imagine can be played. My goodness! What a simply delightful machine! Indeed. Though their popularity has waned recently with the development of the gramophone, of course. <sighs> Science and technology advance at such an overwhelming pace. What an assortment of things there are on these shelves here. Crockery, footwear, clocks and watches, almost anything you can care to imagine. Those are forfeited items, offered for sale by the pawnbroker. What does that really mean, though? When you pawn, or colloquially, pop, an item, the broker loans you money against its worth. He stores the item for an agreed period of time, after which the loan must be repaid. If not, he is free to display it in his shop for sale, at a price of his choosing. Oh, yes, now you've explained it, I'm noticing little price tags on everything. Of course, simply by paying the agreed interest on the loan, one can extend the period of safekeeping. So you may pawn that black garb of yours without fear, my dear fellow. My treasured university uniform? Never! It embodies my student spirit! That's not a calendar you could easily miss, is it? 15th of April. Today's date. Yes, that's not for sale, I must point out. It is an Eastern-style page-day calendar. Every night at midnight, I tear off the front page to reveal the following day's date. The perfect cal calendar for a tearaway fellow such as yourself, Mr. Windebank. And... Who was it who walked out of here with the wrong violin before? Well, when the agreed storage period has passed without repayment, articles are forfeited, you see. So I have to keep a close eye on the date. It's something of a pawnbroker's obsession, you might say. Oh, yes. I can see you're very dedicated to your job. Look at this! Whatever could it be used for? Um, uh, I have no idea. <gasps> There's a small catch just here, look! We're going to open it, aren't we? Oh my, that's amazing! It has some sort of spring-loaded mechanism. Which we'll never manage to put back to the way it was before. What are you two doing? What? What? Us? Uh, nothing! No, nothing at all! Whatever this device is, it seems to have a pair of little windows to look through. I feel as though I've seen something rather similar to this elsewhere. Are they, uh, weird looking binoculars or what? Now what do you suppose this rather enormous, ma this rather enormous machine does? It seems to have two little windows for looking through. Allow me to enlighten you, my dear fellows. What you are looking at is a stereoscope. 
a stereoscope? Fascinating. It is aptly named, I assure you. Look through the eyepieces and see for yourself. Oh, I should be delighted to. Excuse me a moment while I just have a look. Just before you do, there is something I should point out. My dear fellows, in order to see the image properly, stereoscopically, as it were, you will need to be cross-eyed. However, if that is beyond you, it is of little consequence today. Alright then, I'm going to try it. Ah, M Mr. Naruhoto, you must see at once! Oh, uh, alright then. So I need to be cross-eyed, like I'm trying to look at my own nose. Ah yes, here comes the, this is the very obvious gimmick we designed for the 3DS. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering, do yourself a favor, don't actually cross your eyes. It's a good thing that I can't actually cross my eyes. Fun fact, I can't, I can't do that. I can roll my tongue, I can't cross my eyes though. <laughs> but, I can cross my T's. I can definitely cross my T's. Very good at that. Sorry for the handwriting joke, everyone. Wh what the? Uh, I don't believe it. It's just a photographic print, but it seems like you could reach out and touch it. Yes, the sense of depth is startling, is it not? Stereoscopes are one of London's many fads. They are often found in little stalls in the park. People queue for hours to see them. Why? Why are people meddling with such black magic? Ain't this the maid? Yeah, that did look like one of the jurors from uh, Case 3. <laughs> now I think about it. It is no magic, my dear madame. It is, well... Far too complicated to explain at present. We shall save this lesson for another day. 99% sure this was done for the original 3DS release and it doesn't really translate well into the ports. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, the original DS games had the gimmick where you could yell into the microphone, and if you yelled objection when you're, like, presenting evidence, it would, like, automatically say, OBJECTION! And it was great and cool and fun. But obviously you can't do that here. Oh. What? Only tuppence for it! That ain't fair and you know it! So, the article is barely worth a penny, miss. I cannot afford more. Sounds like there's an argument brewing over by the counter. Come on, that can't be right. Have you even had a proper butcher at it? I've seen all I need to see, young girl. Speaking of familiar faces... Wait, don't we know? Uh, I'm sure I recognize her. Oh, yes, it's the young lady from Mr. McGilded's trial two months ago. Her name is Gina Lestrade, my lord. She's a chancer, earns a crust among large crowds, relieving people of their purses. What's commonly called a pickpocket? And she's got a new jacket. Gordon Bennett, you lo- Wait. Was Gordon Bennett a thing they said back then, too? I could have sworn it was, like, a relatively new exclamation. <laughs> but I guess not. <laughs> Hello, Miss Lestrade. I hope you've been well. Eh, what? what y you remember me then, do you? Well, I remember being completely surrounded by smoke, that's for sure. So, what are you doing in here? Down and out like the rest of us. Nothing to eat. Come to pop that black weasel. Sorry, coat, have you? What is it about this black uniform that makes everyone comment on it? Ah, good day. Unless I'm much mistaken. You would be the young pickpocket who stole our experimental smoke grenade launcher. <gasps> Mr. Sholmes! 
So, you have something of value to pawn, do you? Allow me to see the article, and I shall negotiate with Mr. Windebank on your behalf. Pull the other one, I don't need some help from some sticking stuck up D. Get out of my business. Go on or I'll make trouble for you. As you wish, Miss Lestrade. I will happily remove myself from your presence. He's really done it. He's gone. I'm sorry, but as I said, there really is no room for negotiation here. What's that thing he has in his hand? Some kind of metal disc? And you! Go on, leave me alone! Oh, Miss Lestrade, just pretend we aren't here. We shan't be offended in the slightest. suzato san can really stand her ground when she wants to. Whatever. Would you have a look at, um, that's strange. Where's my armband gone? What's the problem? Something wrong? Don't suppose. You looking for this? Actually, after doing some research, yeah, yelling Gordon Bennett was a thing from as far back as then. Holy crap, yeah. I thought he was like some sort of like, prime minister in the 50s or something. The localization team did their research. They certainly did. Because I've heard British people say, Gordon Bennett before, after like, stubbing their toe. So I was like, okay, well, this must be like, a person of some renown recently? But no. No, it's not. <laughs> You're looking for this. Yes, but, but how? And when? And how again? I got talent for it, haven't I? Dive? That's bordering on black magic. And it makes what I was about to say about my armband seem a little... dull. So, what you want to tell me about it then? <laughs> Aww. Somehow I didn't really think you were the sort of person you use a pawnbroker, Miss Lestrade. Yeah, well I am, alright. I'm a Londoner, just like everyone else. Is that a problem, is it? No, no, not at all. It's just that, well... Oh, I get it. I know what you're thinking. That thing probably don't even belong to her. Probably got on the dive, didn't she? Yeah, I can see it written all over in your Chevy Chase. Well, I... I might have been thinking something along those lines. I didn't realize uh, Chevy Chase was also a saying they used, but hey, the more you learn. I know that uh, Chevy Chase is, is his stage name. I don't remember what his actual name is, but... Uh, the guy from National Lampoon and Community. You're not gonna deny it, Mr. Naruhodo? Alright, then I'm just gonna come out and ask you straight. Do you pawn things that you steal from other people? Well, um, I don't know how best to answer that, really. Um. Suppose, sometimes. You're not going to deny it either, Miss Lestrade? Not this time, alright, I swear. That thing belongs to me. The disc that Mr. Windebank is holding. Perhaps we should see what he has to say about all this. Mr. Windebank, what exactly is this metal disc that Miss Lestrade has brought in? It seems to have hundreds of tiny little bumps on the surface. Ah, uh, this is a music disc, you see. For use inside a music box. In a music box? What? You don't even know what a music box is? Tch, Eastern lot ain't too savvy, eh? I know what a music box is, I've just never seen one of these discs before. Small protrusions on the metal disc encode the tune to be played by the music box. You simply insert the disc and set the machine going and beautiful music plays. It's so incredible. Tell us, what tune is on this disc? Well, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you that. There's so many different types of music box, you see. British made, German, Swiss. I have no way of knowing which particular machine this disc was made for. Oh, I see. 
And that's it in a nutshell. I won't have any customers for an item like this if the young lady forfeited it. Really, I'm already offering more than I should at a penny. That's a packet of lies. He told me he did. He said it was, well... He? Who? Never you mind. It just ain't right, that's all. That disc worth good money, I know it is. Well then, you'll have to try your luck at another pawnbroker's, won't you? Ah! She's been in before, of course. This, lad this little tattered demalion. I see. Brought me some dubious article or other with her every single time, I might add. Dubious! What are you trying to say? I'm an honest customer, me. So, is there something dubious about the disc she brought in today? Well, if only it were that simple. Uh, sorry? What do you mean? What she actually brought in was a storage ticket. Uh, -uh. A storage ticket? So... Miss Lestrade has actually come to redeem an article from you today, is that right? Yeah, that's right. A girl like me has a lot of stuff what she needs stored. Alright, yes, that's definitely dubious. The article in question would have been forfeited at midnight tonight. But as she gave me the ticket for it and repaid both the loan and the interest, I was obliged to return the article to her. But what was the article? Do tell us, Mr. Wendebank. The little scamp is wearing it, ma'am the overcoat that she redeemed. Oh. What? What's wrong with that? It fits, don't it? I mean, it's mine, so of course it does. So, what about the disc, then? How does that come into all this? Ah, the disc is something else. A new article to pawn. The girl and I can agree on a price. I'm confused. I thought you said that Miss Lestrade brought in a storage ticket today. It's really quite simple. Yes, the child brought me a storage ticket, and the money owed on it, as you say. For this heavy black coat, uh, for this heavy black coat, which you returned to her care, as I understood it. That's right, yes, and rather unsurprisingly, as soon as the little ragamuffin put the thing on, she went rifling through the pockets. Oh, you mean... What? Don't you know it's rude to stare at a lady? Oh, I see. So it came from the pocket of the overcoat, did it? If you mean this disc, then yes, exactly, ma'am. And she immediately tried to pawn it. For quite a high price as well. It's all rather suspicious, I think. Give it up. I'm just trying to pawn something like anyone else would. Miss Lestrade, may I ask who deposited the overcoat here in the first place? Um, well, me. It doesn't really appear to be your size. Me old man. It's me old man's, ain't it? Is it, Miss Lestrade? Yes, this is definitely all rather suspicious. Out of my way, please. Who's this picture postcard English gentleman? Damn, dude, why did you steal exactly what I was thinking? <laughs> Bruh. Good day to you ladies, gentlemen. What's your problem, eh? There's no problem, as long as you remove yourself. I have a matter to discuss with the proprietor. And if you intend to make a problem of it, I shall see you outside, little girl, for the hiding you deserve. Look, ain't it obvious? I ain't done talking with him yet. You think you're such a gent, you should know how to wait in line. Well, you are an impudent little brat, aren't you? As well as a pickpocket. Eh? Who, who are you? How do you know who I am? 
question is, how do you not know who I am? You haven't the courtesy even to remember the faces of your victims, it seems. What? Y you mean I... Uh, from you? Broker! Uh, yes, sir. I believe this filthy pocket thief has just redeemed an article from you, no? Yes, yes, um... The article in question belongs to me. I demand for it to be returned at once. Oh my. Now that's a lie! What you trying to pull? Give me back my overcoat, you wastrel! Needless to say. Any music box discs, too? No, you can't have it! You just can't! It's me old man's! Oh, it was! Now it's mine! Goodness, Mr. Naruhodo. This is a very awkward situation. Yes. I think perhaps we should hear both sides of the story in a little more detail. Oh great, are we playing arbitrator between an English gentleman and a pickpocket? Alright, let's go. Miss Lestrade, is what the gentleman is saying... What do you think? It's all lies, ain't it? Obviously! I swear on me life, I ain't never laid eyes on that dandy before. Let's hear us now, you little ragamuffin. It's kind of in the job description to be a middleman. Yeah, that's fair. It's kind of what we do. <laughs> you stole it now, didn't you? That ticket you brought in here just now. No, I swear it. I swear to God. It was barely an hour ago. I was walking along the street, minding my own business. And this little gutterling ran into me. I knew at once what had happened. I've been robbed yet again, I thought to myself. Those wretched pickpockets. Yet again? Oh yes, as you can see, I'm a man of impeccable style. This isn't the first time that I've been targeted by these backslum scoundrels. Now then, relinquish my overcoat! I'm just gonna call this guy Speedwagon, because the dude reminds me of Speedwagon so much. Yeah. Come along now, Miss Lestrade. Give the good gentleman his coat back. If you're going to cause trouble, I shall have no choice but to call the police. Hold on. Why does everyone think it's me? Just look at this dandy cove. You think I'm the dodgy one? I'm sorry, but no one's going to believe you. Well, what about evidence? Yeah. Where's your evidence that I stole something, eh? Come on, let's see it. Oh, I have evidence, naturally. You, what? <laughs> evidence that the article Miss Lestrade redeemed actually belongs to this gentleman. Of course, we need only consult Mr. Windbank's ledger to know the truth. We'll be able to look up the name of the person who deposited the article in the first place. Yes, brilliant. I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid that won't be possible. Oh? I never ask customers' names. That's a strict policy of mine. But, why not? Well now, as you can imagine, some of my customers have circumstances to consider. A great many of them prefer to maintain their anonymity. Yes, I see. But then, how can you know if an article belongs to the person asking to redeem it? Oh, it's quite simple. Good sir! Might I trouble you for the watchword associated with the article in question? Of course, it's... Professor. Yes, that's right. And all the evidence we need. This gentleman is the rightful owner of the article, without doubt. A watchword? Interesting. So, about these watchwords, Mr. Windebank. As I just explained, I never ask customers' names when they deposit items with me. There are many reasons why, 
certain customers would like to keep their activities secret. And that wasn't exactly a subtle glance at Mr. Sholmes, now was it? <laughs> Great detectives have no dark secrets. None at all. Yes, well, uh, anyway, that's why I always ask for a watchword whenever I accept a new article. In many ways, it's like the secret combination of numbers used to unlock a vault. A date of deposit, a description, and a watchword uniquely identify each item. And of course, then I give the storage ticket to the customer. When someone comes to redeem something, I ask for the ticket and the watchword. And if that someone tells you the correct watchword, you return the article? That's right, sir, yes. Just as soon as the requisite fee is paid. And I have supplied you with the information you require already. But for the avoidance of doubt, the article in question is an overcoat, deposited two months ago on the 15th of February. With a watchword of Professor. All perfectly correct information, sir. But, but ow! Really, this is beyond a joke now. There's no further room for doubt. Ugh. Well, it's sounding like he pilfered it, that's for sure. Oh, Mr. Sholmes isn't looking there right now. Uh, excuse me, but who are you? One would expect the Inquirer to introduce himself first. Though clearly you are not British, so perhaps our ways are foreign to you. Oh, uh, sorry, yes. We're from the Empire of Japan. We're studying here. Oh, yes, Japan. I've heard talk of the place. Its inhabitants live on some fiery brown-colored soup, dressed with exotic spices. You might be thinking of somewhere else. And what was that theatrical gesticulation about? Perhaps. Anyway, if you are a gentleman, sir, you offer your own name first before inquiring after the name of another. Uh, of course, yes. Uh, I'm Ryanosuke Naruhodo. I'm a lawyer. Well, a student of law, really. My name is Susato Mikatoba. I'm Mr. Naruhodo's assistant. I see. My name is Benedict. Yes. <laughs> what is with these food puns? I, th I thought Beef Stroganoff was going to be the end of it, but no, we get frickin' Eggert Benedict. <laughs> Not even like Egbert Benedict, just fucking Eggert. Enchante. He's so refined in how he holds himself and how he speaks, but that name is... suspicious. <laughs> now, to the matter at hand. My overcoat! Return it at once. Someone with the style to carry it off. Ugh. Every move he makes, every breath he takes, can't stand watching him. So, let that be an end to the matter. And thank you for your custom, Mr. Eggert Benedict, sir. With such reasonable rates of interest, I may even decide to come back. This is why I hate grown-ups. Just because I'm a diver, everyone thinks that makes me a liar. And the contents of the coat pockets, if you please, broker. But of course, sir, uh, here's the disc for you. Just this one. But, pardon, sir. I was expecting another. Uh, that is, uh, I deposited another. Another disc? Oh, um, oh dear. I regret to inform you, sir, that was what was deposited with me was merely the overcoat. The disc happened to be in one of the pockets, but I was completely unaware of it until now. 
So, Gutterling, you're hiding more of what's rightfully mine, are you? Says who, eh? I don't know nothing about it. Very well. Then I shall bid you farewell. Say goodbye to style. Wait a minute. That disc is mine. Ah! Wh what do you think you're doing, you little tramp? You've you've drawn blood, you filthy animal! Oh my, yes. There's blood on the disc. Because of all those sharp little bumps. The man must have scratched his finger on them. Well, I found it first, all right. I mean, it belonged to me old man. So you're not having it. Oi, you. You take it. M me If I hang on to it, they'll have me off again. So you keep hold of it. Miss Lestrade, I... Why is this disc so important to her? Music box. Disc. All right. Well. Um. You there, in the black library. Hand that disc to me at once, please. No, don't. He's lying. Grown-ups are all liars. What do I do now? How am I going to resolve this? <laughs> that, that's that's how I would do it, but uh, clearly that's not the solution. Here. All right, someone on the localization team skipped their breakfast. Man, I I need breakfast. Look at all the little bumps on the disc. They're so tiny. Yes, the protrusions are called pins, and they pluck the teeth of the comb to make notes. And just on the edge, there's a small amount of blood. Yes, the blood of the mysterious Mr. Eggert Benedict. When Miss Lestrade tried to grab the disc room, the pin scratched his fingers, it seems. Like when you're grating some daikon radish and accidentally catch your finger. Ouch, just thinking about it hurts. And puts me off eating radish. What the fuck? Excuse you? Oh, there's a little scrap of paper stuck onto the reverse side of the disc. Look! And a scribbled word or two. It looks like somebody's name. For... McGilded. McGilded? It, it couldn't be. But it is Mr. Naruhoto. A name I shall never forget for as long as I live. Why? Why is his name on this? I imagine that's all we were supposed to be seeing, but... Okay, that's what they thats what they look like in 3D. Because it was like, oh yeah, they're just bumps, right? Well, you can't really see them from that perspective, but when it looks like that, oh yeah, they're hella spiky. Mr. Windebank is clearly at a loss here. We have to do something about this before he reaches for that revolver of his. Wow, Miss Lestrade is really looking daggers at, them, at that mysterious gentleman. We need to do something to calm things down before she loses control and attacks him again. Look at those piercing eyes. He's clearly in no mood to talk. We have to do something quickly before this mysterious gentleman leaves to fetch the police or something. Everyone's after McGilded's Lucky Charm cereal. They're after me lucky charms! Oh no! What are you kids doing? Um, Mr. Sholmes? What are you examining with such keen interest there? As you enjoy a bar of caramel, I see. <laughs> Logic scrolls over to see her luck. Logic immediately scrolls back over to ignore him. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I, I wanted to talk to everybody first because I had a feeling Sherlock was uh, was our way to proceed. <laughs> so, you found me at last, Mr. Naruhodo. Sorry? 
After that young pickpocket sent me on my way, I was forced to look in the shadows. Cruelly ostracized, as the rest of you partook in the jovial atmosphere of fellowship. I had nothing to occupy my mind, but was too ashamed to let society see what my downfall had done to me. So, feigning mock interest, I, proceeded, I pretended to examine the tedious trinkets in this desolate place. Whilst, as you shrewdly observed, gnawing on the only friend I have left, this 7% solution of caramel. Pray, do you claim to understand the depths of my despair, Mr. Narahodo? But how could you? I was so lonely, so desperately lonely. Then why on earth didn't you rejoin the conversation? Things have gone from bad to worse here, you know. Yes, I overheard much of your conversation. Or rather, my craving for human contact, my ears devoured every word that was uttered. You really were sad, weren't you? Poor Mr. Sholmes. I feel simply awful for you. It would seem. If my inferences are correct. Oh, surely you're not about to tell us that you've solved the entire case once again. My dear madame, sometimes I wonder, were my genius for deduction to be commoditized? How much could I pawn it for? It seems Mr. Sholmes has had another one of his flashes of inspiration. But who knows if it will help us to resolve the situation between Miss Lestrade and the mysterious gentleman. What's the right thing to do here? I mean... Obviously, we're gonna listen to the, deduc to the deduction. Come on. Well, Miss Lestrade, it would appear you find yourself in something of a predicament. Where the blue blazes have you been, eh? Pardon? When a lady's in trouble, a true gent's supposed to be there to help? Straight away! Not an hour later! Harsh. And who, pray tell, are you? Mr. Eggert Benedict. You have in my eyes a veritably encyclopedic array of curiosities about your person. Nevertheless, there are two immovable conclusions I have drawn. Uh, I beg your pardon? The first is this. The true reason for your visit to this pawn brokery today is something you have not yet revealed. <gasps> and the second is this. A considerable crime is in contemplation, one you will orchestrate with intent to steal a vast sum of money. Well, Mr. Benedict, what say you to my deductions? How? He's turned as white as a hard-boiled egg. It would seem that once again, Mr. Sholmes has made a flawless deduction. Just, just who do you think you are, sir? Ah, yes. As I had hoped. That is precisely the pained expression I was looking for. So, shall we begin? The time has come for yet another Herlock Sholmes's Logic and Reasoning Spectacular. First of all, we must ask ourselves, on what business you ventured to this pawn brokery today? You claim to have followed this pickpocket here, had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. As revealed by that which you hold in your hand. Yes, what brought you to this shop in the first place is the staff recruitment flyer piece of paper in your hand is a staff wanted advertisement from this very shop. Yet even the most unobservant would soon realize that a man of your appearance has no need of such employ. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. The cane, the 
like you unwittingly clutch to your person exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. What utter rot! I've I've had this cane for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the missing ferrule. The end of any walking cane would be terminated with a metal ferrule to protect the wooden tip. And yet, detailed analysis shows the wooden tip of this stick to be utterly bare. Therefore, there's only one conclusion. The rod that you hold in your hand, which appears to be a walking cane, is in fact, no cane at all. You recoil, sir! Is something wrong? I, well, I... And in your recoiling, you inadvertently facilitate the answer of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth behind this rod you bear? Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle you see. From the moment I saw it, my suspicions were aroused. What walking cane demands such a stout handle, mused I. But of course, as I said, this is no walking cane. No, that rod. Is the broken handle of a shovel. What? Are you insane? And now, having determined this undeniable truth, the conclusion is clear. Your true motive for coming here was to take employment at this establishment in order to excavate the ground beneath the premises. What a calculated crime you've conceived, sir. A wickedly calculated crime. <gasps> wow, this is, <laughs> this is already a disaster. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. For we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, intend to excavate the ground beneath this pawn brokery with a broken shovel? What on earth do you propose I could expect to find there? Some. Long forgotten treasure, I suppose. Save for such a fanciful theory, what possible reason could I have to do as you say? Oh, but there is ample reason. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? Let us consider what would motivate a man to infiltrate a shop such as this and covertly dig beneath its floor. The answer is revealed by the council notice on the counter to which your eyes were in inadvertently drawn. This letter gives notice of public works to be carried out in the local area. And according to the enclosed plan of the upcoming sewerage works, beneath this shop runs a sewer that adjoins another, one that runs under the bank on the opposite side of the road. This madness has entered the sewers now, has it? By excavating the ground beneath our feet, you would gain access to the waterway. It flows in very close proximity to the great vault of the financial institution opposite. What are you? In summary, sir, you're, you devised a master plan to pull off an elaborate bank robbery by dint of the underground tunnels. Master plan? Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. With what plunder did the thief hope to make off from the underground vault of the bank? Uh, are you quite serious? Having consulted with Scotland Yard some days ago, I happen to know the answer. But naturally, the answer is no secret to you, is it, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. A postcard of the Great Exhibition? Afraid you've quite lost me. 
currently in the final stages of preparation. The Great Exhibition will soon be underway. And the government has provided extra funds to complete its centerpiece, the Crystal Tower. Funds that currently sit in the vault of the bank, on the other side of this road. Pardon? Yes, the considerable crime to which you have been contemplating is the theft of that which sits in the vault of that bank. The special reserve funds for the Great Exhibition. Of course, that is top secret police information, so keep it under your hat, please. You can keep a lot under that hat, that's for sure. Also, holy crap, that is one hell of an absurd explanation. This concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this pawnbroking puzzle. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, Mr. Sholmes? Well, Mr. Narhodo, an impressively upbeat deduction for a detective racked with loneliness, would you not agree? Was it true what you said about the bank over the road and what it has in its vault? Indeed, though few know of its existence. Oh crap, sorry. I got a, I got a ping on Discord and I had to check it out, and then I accidentally clicked through uh, some of the text here. Indeed, though few know of its existence, it is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. Gregson told me, in the strictest confidence. But you just announced it to everyone here. Rather loudly, in fact. Ah! And if it's such a big secret, how would Mr. Benedict have come to find out about it? There can be but one explanation for that. Clearly it's because the man is a criminal. But what if he didn't know anything about the money in the vault? If he is a criminal, as you said, then buying a brand new shovel is sure to be the first thing he does now that you've revealed the secret. Oh. Or if he doesn't, maybe Mr. Windebank will. He already has plenty of shovels here, after all. Oh my life! I assure you, I'm not so unscrupulous. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, hopefully this has taught you a valuable lesson. Sensitive information must be handled with the utmost of care. One can never be sure that someone privy to secrets won't disclose them. And once the word is out, it's out. Perhaps I'll think twice before confiding in you next time, Mr. Sholmes. An excellent idea, Mr. Narhodo. An excellent idea. <laughs> well then, Mr. Narhodo, you know what to do, I'm sure. Yes, let's listen to that great deduction again and see if we can massage it into shape. Very well then, let us start once more from the beginning. Of Herlock Sholmes' magnificent logic and reasoning spectacular. <sighs> All right. So until we get to a point where we need to correct, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this unsaid. <laughs> I'm just gonna vibe to the to the deduction music because it's so good. Yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place is the staff recruitment flyer. So, by Mr. Sholmes' reasoning, Mr. Benedict came here in order to apply for a job so he could dig down through the floor. Yes, in an attempt to tunnel into the sewers to gain access to the money in the vault of the bank across the road. But he wouldn't get very far with a broken shovel, would he? No, I think it's fair to say his motives lie elsewhere. The question is, where? What did bring Mr. Benedict here at this particular point in time? I wanna... Okay, I guess I can't examine his hand. That's a proper English gentleman's cane, isn't it? Look at the beautifully polished brass on the handle. 
Yes, but Mr. Sholmes is right. It's not the sort of handle you usually see on a cane. Perhaps it's the latest London fashion. I mean, that's just guesswork, of course. Perhaps you could adopt a cane, Mr. Naruhoto. It might rather suit you. I have a feeling it might argue with the sword around my waist. Oh. Look at the scribble notes on the back of the flyer here. I don't believe it. What is it? Listen to what it says. Name, Gina Lestrade. Height, 5 foot 2. Green cap, scruffy waistcoat, grubby white shirt, blue satchel. Right. It's a detailed description of Miss Lestrade. G goodness. There's even a sketch of her with hat and all. Although if you showed it to her, she'd fire that smoke grenade launcher in his face for sure. And look, the details of the shop have been written down here too. Windebanks Pawn Brokery, Baker Street. Redemption deadline, 15th of April. Which is today's date. Why would Mr. Benedict have all that information scrawled on the back of that piece of paper? Take that! Yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place is the info about Miss Lestrade. Quite so, my dear fellow. It would appear that the writing and sketch on the reverse of the flyer pertain to the pickpocket, Miss Lestrade, and to Mr. Windebank's pawn brokery here. You originally told us that you had merely given chase after Miss Lestrade stole the redemption ticket from you. That, sir, is a thinly veiled lie. It is the information on the back of the flyer that led you here today, by which I mean here to Windebank's Pawn Brokery, and today, the redemption deadline of that overcoat. So, you waited outside for the young girl matching the description you've written down to arrive. Hmm. And you have gone to some lengths to hide the reason for your pursuit of Miss Lestrade. In other words, there's some ulterior motive for your actions. The cane which you unwittingly clutched your purse and exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. What utter rot! I've, I've had this cane for years! The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the missing fairy. Um, what's a fairy? It's the metal cap commonly found on the end of a cane, Mr. Naruhoto. Oh, the bit that makes the nice clacking sound on the pavement. Yes, exactly. And Mr. Sholmes is right. It appears to be missing on this cane. But it doesn't actually look broken, does it? No, it doesn't. Though the gentleman certainly did recoil when Mr. Sholmes identified the cane as suspicious. In other words, there's some secret about the cane that Mr. Benedict would rather we don't know. It's the hat. As stylish as it no doubt is, I don't think this white top hat suits the man, do you? No, not at all. The more I look at it, the more something strikes me as suspicious about it. I think perhaps it's not so much that it strikes you as suspicious, but rather that the, hi the hat is just striking. Uh, I suppose you're probably right. Perhaps the hat isn't what we're looking for. Well, I want to present the hat, though. Look here, Miss Suzato. There's some letters on the handle. Ah, yes, those must be initials, I think. In the West, it's customary for people to engrave their belongings with the first letters of their name. So Herlock Sholmes would be HS, you mean. That's right. And the initials on this cane, obviously. Oh. A. G? Why does it feel as though that's not quite right? Because you can't get Benedict Egbert from A. G. Take that! So he's using an alias. I mean, obviously he's using an alias. Or he stole it. Either's an option. The contradiction of which I speak of is, of course, the initialing. A most astute observation, wouldn't you say, Mr. Eggert Benedict? 
We are led to believe, sir, that your initials are EB. Yet, in a most possessive manner, you have in your grasp a cane bearing the initials AG. An incontrovertible contradiction indeed, would you not agree? No, you're... you're wrong. This... this cane isn't... You said before that you've had that cane for years. So don't try to tell us you just borrowed it from a friend or found it in a park. In short, though you hold yourself to be a gentleman, you have withheld your true name. You recoil, sir. Is something wrong? I, well, I, I... And in your recoiling, you inadvertently facilitate the answer of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth behind this rod you bear? Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle which you evidently would like to conceal is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. Let's consider the bare bones of what happened here. Miss Lestrade redeemed that fine-looking overcoat. And now a mysterious man has appeared, introducing himself with a fake name, and claiming that the overcoat belongs to him. But we know that he actually identified Miss Lestrade from a written description would suggest that everything else he's told us is untrue. So what we need to do here is somehow prove that the overcoat cannot possibly belong to him. Oh, the seam on the shoulder there is coming apart. Look! So it is. Do you know a moment ago when Mr. Benedict was surprised by something that was said? I thought I heard him make a rather strange noise. It sounded a bit like a tiny growl. But now I think it was probably the sound of the seam ripping open. If you look closely, it does seem to be a very tight fit. The sleeves are stretched to bursting, and he wouldn't have a hope of fastening it at the front. If he were to run around in it, I'm sure the whole thing would fall apart. Hmm, that I'd like to see. Uh, sorry? So, how can we make Mr. Benedict run around? She's really giving this some thought. Suzato, no. Take that! The split seam, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. <gasps> yes, because the overcoat is rather obviously a poor fit. Having forced it over your broad shoulders, the seam is already breaking apart. My suspicions were aroused from the outset. When you so baldly lied about your name and so boldly waylaid this pickpocket. <gasps> this catalog of untruths has all been for one very specific purpose. To steal the article the young girl redeemed from Mr. Windbank. <gasps> Nani? But what really irks me is this. The considerable crime I initially imagined has been considerably curtailed. To abscond with a redeemed item. Yep, yep. Let's find out what this new great crime is. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. For we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, designed a wheeze to filch some tawdry article of honage. Have you forgotten that I have redeemed the article in the proper manner using the watchword? Had I not been the one to deposit it in the first place? How could I possibly have known the relevant, relevant details? Ne sais pas. Oh, but the watchword can be discovered. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? Let us consider how one might come to learn a secret watchword relating to the pawn property of another. 
The method is revealed by the council notice on the counter at which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. The direction of the deduction must change rather dramatically now, I think. Yes, no more talk of tunneling into the sewers. Which is a pity, because it all sounded rather exciting. Anyway, you can't deny that this mysterious gentleman did know the watchword. Yes, Professor. If you didn't know that word, Mr. Windebank would never allow you to redeem the article. Or, looking at it another way, if you did know that word, Mr. Windebank would allow you to redeem the article whether it was yours or not. So the question is, could this gentleman have found the watchword out somehow? Look at this, Miss Suzato. Oh, it appears to be a memo that Mr. Windebank has scribbled to himself. Let's see, what does it say? Oh, Professor. Well, that makes it obvious, doesn't it? Mr. Windebank must make a note of the watchwords his customers give him right before their eyes. And in alarmingly clear script as well. Oh dear, I... I don't know where to look. Who knows what other secrets I might see. There's other things I want to examine on this, de on this desk, though. This is Mr. Windebank's gun. Yes, loaded with only one bullet, he said. It would appear that being a pawnbroker is a very life-or-death profession. And that might just be this particular establishment. Take that! The method is revealed by the notelet on which the counter on the counter to which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Yes, the broker here follows the same procedure whenever a customer comes to redeem an article. He asks the customer for the watchword and notes down the response uttered on a notelet he has on hand. Then he consults his ledger and confirms whether or not the watchword matches that of the article in question. I'd expect nothing less of a diligent pawnbroker. But his diligence clearly has its disadvantages. What are you talking about? It is increasingly apparent that you were present in this shop before your accusation against Miss Lestrade. In all likelihood, you followed her inside and observed her talking to Mr. Windebank. When the diligent broker made a note of the watchword, as is his common practice, you observed him writing the word Professor on the note lit beside the ledger. And that, sir, was the master plan you devised to steal the pawned article from the young Miss Lestrade. But master plan? Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. Why would you go to such lengths to redeem that particular article from this pawnbroker? Are you quite serious? For an ill-fitting overcoat hardly seems to justify the effort, much less a worthless music box disc. But naturally, you had very good reasons to make them yours, didn't you, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. The articles we are talking about are the overcoat and the music box disc that was in one of the pockets, which according to Mr. Windebank isn't even worth a penny. And yet this man went to such lengths to steal them. Why? I wonder if perhaps we already have the evidence we need to explain it, Mr. Narahodo. Could we? Really? I'd better have a thorough look through all the evidence we've collected so far. Take that! As a good lawyer always does, check your evidence before presenting it. So I'm not a very good lawyer, although I checked it way before presenting it. So I guess I'm a good lawyer. I'm such a good lawyer that I'm an amazing lawyer. It, it all wraps around. You see, this music box disc tells us all we need to know. What's that on the back? It reads, for McGilded. Ah, Mr. Magnus McGilded, the unfortunate 
philanthropist who perished in curious circumstances at the Old Bailey two months ago. A prominent man in London, though his loan mongering demonstrated a distinct lack a distinct lack of scruples. So, you're an associate of his, are you? Or perhaps a subordinate? Mr. McGilded was a man of unusually small stature. In fact, he was precisely the right size for that overcoat that you've squeezed yourself into. <sighs> Your true identity remains shrouded in mystery, Mr. Egbert Benedict. But the final conclusion here is crystal clear. The reason you came to this pawn brokery today. was to retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus McGilded. Ah! Rip. Alright, well this is interesting. We're gonna finally learn more about uh, Magnus McGilded. Well, well, Mr. Magnus McGilded. Not a name I expected to hear in these circumstances. Mr. Sholmes, I'm afraid there's something very troubling on my mind. Pray tell, Miss Uzato. Well, according to what Mr. Windebank told us earlier, Today was the final day on which the coat could have been redeemed, was it not? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Today would be precisely two months since it was first deposited. Well, today is the 15th of April, so two months ago today... Would have been the 15th of February, sir. That's right. It's all carefully recorded in my ledger. Deposited at 10.30pm, I see. What? But... but that suggests... Yes, the 15th of February is precisely the day on which the omnibus murder took place. And half past ten in the evening is precisely the time at which the terrible events were unfolding. Suggestive is not the word. It would seem the matter is entirely beyond coincidence. You are, of course, at liberty to make whatever outlandish deductions you choose, however. I must insist you hand over the music box disc now. It would be a terrible shame for you to return to your native land in a box. What do I do? Why I never? There are some things a man must protect at all costs. This may be one of the, this may well be one of those things. Again, it may not. M Mr. Windebank? This is my shop. I can't allow any harm to come to my customers. If that were to happen, I should have to take my own life. M Mr. Windebank, no! All right, that's enough. Oh, Scotland Yard. Uh, Inspector Gregson? Inspector. That's right, Sunshine. The alarm was raised on one of our dedicated emergency lines. So we got here as fast as we could. Now, what's all this about, eh? Oh, praise be, you're here at last. I was moments away from forfeiting my own life in my very own establishment. Sorry, I gotta kill a, I gotta kill a spam bot. It would seem you have the upper hand. As popular as always, Logic. You betcha. One day there will be hot local singles in my area. But not today. Right. You lot have got some explaining to do. I don't appreciate being bothered with some petty argy-bargy. petty Mr. Windebank very nearly met with his end. 
Yeah, by his own gun, as far as I can tell. Oh dear. The whole of Britain could meet with its end. If I don't get to the bottom of this case, I'm supposed to be working on. What? What on earth is the case, Inspector? Spare no detail, Gregson. I... I might have said a little too much. No, no matter. Nothing to do with you lot. Anyway, sir, you're gonna have to come with me down at the station. But of course, Inspector. Ah! He's getting away! Get after him, lads! Whistle the beat officer, too! Sir! Gregson, what the fuck? There's been a spate of thefts at pawn shops around here recently. So we fit emergency buttons underneath the counters for brokers to let us know when there's trouble. Oh, Inspector. I was very worried there for a while. Very worried indeed. Now then, Mr. Permanently in Mourning. Oh, yes? <laughs> he targeted Gregson's one weakness, the fish and chips. I'll be taking that whatever it is of McGilded's down to the yard, thank you very much. So hand it over. Oh, yes, of course. No, don't, don't give it to him. It's mine, that is, mine. Sorry, miss. Anything belonging to McGilded has to be taken in as evidence now. Uh, as evidence? If the police demand something as evidence, my dear fellow, we have no choice but to capitulate. It's all yours, Inspector. <sighs> and so, we handed Mr. McGilded's disc over to Inspector Gregson and were summarily turfed out of the shop and onto the street. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> okay. So it was a bit shorter of a stream today, but I guess this is, uh, this is good to go. I definitely... I could probably go for, like, another half hour or so, but definitely not for another entire, like, cycle. So, yeah. Guess, uh, guess that's it for today. Uh, got a very interesting case starting up here. Uh, lots of, lots of things being teased that I can't wait to see where they go with it. Uh, well, I, I'm pretty excited for what's hap what's going to happen next. I'm not sure when I'm going to be streaming next, but, uh, hopefully it'll be soon. But, again, don't know for sure. Um, in any case, thank you all for coming today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. And I hope you join me next time as we, uh, continue on. I really should have examined Baker Street first because, uh, didn't realize I would only get to go to the pawn brokery and that would be it. <laughs> I was kind of thinking I'd get to explore some more. But oh well. Things happen. Uh, if you want to help support the channel, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. I stream on Twitch and I port all my videos to YouTube so you can check me out either here or there. Uh, if you want to help support the channel even more, feel free to check out my Patreon. Throw a dollar or two my way. It'd be really cool of you. Uh, last but not least, uh, I also write fanfiction on an archive of our own. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, check me out over there too. It's all a lot of fun. But with all that said, have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next time for some more Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. But until then, toodaloo.